Gray Man is supported by Patreon. Donate now and receive special early access. Hello, 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 and I am the Gray Man. Welcome back to the finale of Mega Man 5. So, I've got a bit of a confession. I was kind of running out of stuff to say about this game in the last episode, and so I actually had to take a break and kind of collect my thoughts. And I don't mean a short break. I don't mean like a couple of minutes. I don't mean a couple of hours. I am recording this literally days after I had initially um, done the video. Um, or started the playthrough, I should say. So... I've been giving this game... I've been trying to give this game a fair shake. Um, and it's not a bad game. It is one of the better NES games. But I think I have to come around and I have to admit that this is the weakest Mega Man game. Like, just by sheer virtue of the fact that I literally ran out of stuff to talk about. And that is always the trickiest bit of criticism that you can give anything. Like, it's easy to review the stuff that is really, really good. It's easy to review the stuff that is really, really awful. But when it comes to the stuff that's just, like, competent but not remarkable, like, that is easily the most nebulous area when it comes to any kind of critique or criticism. It kind of, um, reminds me. So, I'm a really big fan of, uh, bad movies. I, I love watching bad films. Um, and of course I love watching bad films, because I went to college in Minnesota, and that's Mystery Science Theater Country. Um, got to see Troll 2 in the theater, which uh, was kind of like a big eye-opening moment for me. Um, but uh, that's a whole other story I'll get back to. But I like watching bad films because um, frequently they're entertaining in spite of their badness, and even if they're not entertaining, like, a bad movie still makes me feel something, you know? I, I I have a reaction, like, even if it's completely antithetical to my values or my tastes as just, like, a, as a film goer, I just, you know, I get something out of it. It's just kind of the mediocre, middle-of-the-road films, just kind of that just, the ones that just fall out of your brain the instant that you stop watching them. Ooh, I cannot believe I made that. Um, those are on. Oh, I did not make that one. Um, just a, just the just the forgettable films that just you know really kind of make me angry because I go this. There's so much about this that you could have pushed in one direction or the other. You could have like made this a really remarkable film if you just put like a little bit of extra time and care into it. Or if you just put, like, a little bit less, this could be a fucking train wreck, you know? Just, uh, this could have been something really egregious, but we still would have remembered it on that front. Uh, it kind of makes me think, um, so I'm a big fan of, um, uh, Nathan Rabin. He used to write for the, uh, the AV Club. Uh, he writes independently now. Um, go check out his website. It's, uh, it's really good. But, um, he is the creator of the, uh, World of Flops article, which kind of talks about some of the biggest uh, failures in pop culture. And um, it, uh, it 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 has uh, three different types of uh, flops that he includes. Because the, the flops originally were just movies, but he kind of started to include, like, bigger uh, pop culture flops. Like, he had um, an article recently for the Fire, or for the fire Festival. Um, and the three different tiers of uh, flop are failure, Fiasco and Secret Success. Uh, Secret Success is kind of like something that achieved like um, cult status later on, so it kind of you know got appreciated on that front. Um, and the failure, I think, is probably the most ignoble reward, like because any anybody can achieve failure. You know, just um, failure is merely the absence of success. And by that same token. Uh, you know, just, like, anybody who fails, like, uh, will probably just do just fine down the road. Like, um, they'll be able to recover from it and just move on. Like, um, for as much as, uh, a bunch of, uh, superhero fans like to talk it up, Batman and Robin could be considered a failure. You know, you can't call Batman and Robin a good movie, but, you know, it didn't lose that much money, and it just, like, you know... 
everybody in that film ended up, you know, still getting work. Uh, and, you know, we got better Batman films down the line, so... You know, just everything just kind of worked out. Um, but then you have fiascos, which can have, like, widespread effects on things. Like, um... You know, fiascos can just, like, you know, shut down movie studios or just, like, ruin careers or even take lives in it. You know, just, uh... A fiasco can have just, like, far-reaching, um... You know, implications. But at the same time... Like, a fiasco, like, kind of has, like, this mad ambition behind it. It has, like, this... You know... Like, thought or just kind of anything else that, like, a failure typically wouldn't have, you know? And so... Like, a fiasco is way more memorable than a failure. And I keep on talking about all these lofty things, and, like, you know, Mega Man 5 is not a failure, but... You know, it's not a failure by any stretch of the imagination. It's still a well-made game, it's a well-designed game. It's still... ...fun, like, but... ...compared to a bunch of the other... ...Mega Man titles, it's just kind of like, eh. It's it's the Ma it's the Matthew McConaughey romantic comedy of, of Mega Man titles. <laughs> wow, I'm really stretching for that analogy. <laughs> it is the it is the Sandra Bullock romantic comedy of. of, of <laughs> who, who else has made like a bunch of really you know mediocre mediocre romantic comedies? <laughs> I can't believe that's the genre I'm going towards. Because some of my favorite movies are romantic comedies. You know, one of my favorite movies is, uh, When Harry Met Sally, or, uh, hell, my actual, my actual favorite movie is Secretary, so I really shouldn't be saying that. <laughs> and I think that's also emblematic of my struggle while, uh, while talking about this game, is the fact that I've talked about literally anything else but the game. You know, I went off on, like, you know, um, fucking anime fan service in the third episode. I rambled for a really long time about Star Wars in the second episode. Just what the hell is even this commentary right now? <laughs> I, I, I almost imagine myself just having a... Uh, like a small uh, like basket next to me that just has like random conversation topics just trying to see if I can keep this going for the allotted amount of time. <laughs> what even the hell is my life right now? Um, and I kind of think of, uh, you know, going back to, uh, the Nathan Rabin thing. Uh, he kind of comes to mind because I was, uh, kind of talking about, um, uh, film flops and failures with a, uh, with a friend of mine, and she genuinely asked me what it kind of con kind of constitutes in my mind. And, um, you know, I, I, I do kind of like the, the movies that have, like, the, the wild, unrealized ambition. Um, I think if you're talking the perfect bad movie or the perfect movie flop, I think you have to talk about uh, Battlefield Earth. Like, that is the textbook definition of just, like, a, uh, a of an absolute disaster. Like, not only is it, like, incompetently made and written and, you know, just acted, it also had all the behind-the-scenes stuff, and I'm not talking about, um, the fact that it was written by L. Ron Hubbard. I'm talking about, uh, the studio itself. So, for those of you who don't know, Battlefield Earth was, um, produced by this, uh, studio called Franchise Pictures, which, um, uh, specialized in vanity projects for, uh, different actors and, uh, filmmakers. So, what they would do is they would seek out a bunch of these, uh, you know, big Hollywood stars, and say, hey, we'd be happy to make your vanity project, let's just, um, you know, waive your typically large salary, and you'll make all of your profit off of the, uh, back end, and we'll be able to keep the production budget low, and hey, your movie will be made. And so, John Travolta was commanding, um, 20 million a film at the time, because of, uh, all of his success post, uh, Pulp Fiction. And he wanted to get Battlefield Earth made. He had wanted to get it made since the 70s. Uh, and... But nobody wanted to touch it because of the uh, connection to L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology. And so Franchise Pictures comes along and says, Hey, we can make this movie for you. And he goes, you know, okay, great. Like, uh, we'll get it done. And the announced budget for Battlefield Earth 
was a hundred million dollars. Oh, um, I'm sorry. Before I go on, um, I know what I said about the Buster Run in the first episode, and I'm gonna be doing that for Dr. Wily, but, uh, just to kind of move things along, I'm going to, uh, be doing that for uh, using, uh, the proper weapons to fight the Robot Master. So, here we go. Um, anyway, so franchise pictures. So, they announced that the budget of Battlefield Earth was a hundred million, but, uh, later court cases and, uh, Looking at uh, accounting documents show that possibly only 70 or 60 million went to Battlefield Earth. Um, and Franchise Pictures basically skimmed off the top for the rest of the budget. And so they were literally trying to pull the plot from the producers. Like, let's get this absolute flop of a movie made and we'll just skim off the budget. And once it loses all of its money at the box office, which it did, uh, they won't be coming after us and asking about the tax paperwork. <laughs> so yeah, Battlefield Earth was basically made so, like, a bunch of people can literally, you know, run this, like, you know, Ponzi scheme and run away with the money. <laughs> um, I'm actually gonna recharge my weapons. Oh, there was a little thing, um that I didn't know that I wanted to look up. So if you have all of your life up and all of your weapons charged, apparently if you use an M tank around a big group of enemies, all of them will drop extra lives. Uh, which I did not know. I had never tried that trick before. Um, and sadly, I will not be able to try that trick because we're at the end of the game. Um, so yeah, like technically speaking, like not only was Battlefield Earth an awful movie, but, um, yeah, it inspired a bunch of court cases once, um, they kind of found out how Franchise Pictures was running their, uh, running their studio, and it ended up shutting down the studio. So that is, like, the very picture of just a movie flop. Let's see here. Oh, I want to point this out. The gravity hold allows me to kill Gyro Man without even touching him. I command you to die! Oh, but maybe not. Okay, <laughs> I negated my moment of awesomeness right there. I was gonna... <laughs> I was gonna try to kill him with mine bullets. That's telekinesis, Kyle. Oh yeah, and that's another thing, is that... Th this is one area where I would definitely call the game lazy, is the fact that when you refight all of the Robot Masters, it just brings you back to the original room in their original stage. It's like, come on, dude! You could, every other game had the special room for the final boss area. You couldn't even be bothered to do that. Did we, did we magically go back in time to see if we could fight these robot masters again? Um, and in spite of everything I just told you, I do highly recommend watching Battlefield Earth. It is one of the most entertainingly bad movies you will ever see in your life. It is, it is glorious. Just... <laughs> Does nothing in the plot make sense? The acting is just, like, uh, atrocious. And it's so bad that it's even incompetently shot. Um... Like, for whatever reason, um... So, uh, Battlefield Earth was directed by this guy, uh, named, uh, Roger Christian. Who worked as the first assistant director, uh, on The Phantom Menace. So I think they hired him because he'd be able to do the, uh... Find cheap ways to do the special effects. And, uh... He did! Like, uh, the special effects certainly look cheap, but, um... For whatever reason, in his infinite wisdom, he decided to shoot 99% of the movie at Dutch angles. Uh, and for those of you who don't know what a Dutch angle is, that's where you just kind of, uh, tilt the camera slightly. Um, and usually, you do a- you do a shot like that to kind of convey something, like, slightly askew, or something, like, kind of, you know, just off. You use it frequently for, like, very surreal scenes. You don't use it for, like, an action scene, or you don't use it for, like, you know, a scene of just, like, you know, people just standing there talking. Um, and what's funny is if you listen to the, uh, director's commentary, which was clearly recorded after the film had bombed, like, you hear him talking about it, and he just sounds, like, so sad and so defeated. His only justification was saying that he wanted to make the movie look like a comic book. 
which as a comic artist, I, I am kind of offended at by proxy. I'm kind of like, you know what? Even the most famous, ambitious comic artist would not use Dutch angles for 99% of uh, the movie. And there's even kind of a moment where there's a scene where like John Travolta is watching like um, somebody on like a video monitor. Um, and the camera pointed at the video monitor is filming it at a Dutch angle, and the footage on the video monitor is also at a Dutch angle. So it's a Dutch angle filming a Dutch angle. <laughs> I don't think it's on Netflix streaming anymore. It used to be. Um, and I mention that because Netflix streaming actually had the director's cut. And if you can believe it, the director's cut is even worse. <laughs> like, it, it is even worse than the theatrical version. It's like Donnie Darko or something like that. Somehow the director's cut is actually worse. <laughs> yeah, I said it. Uh, da, 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 da. E okay, even this boss fight right here, like Dr. Wily... He doesn't even want to bother, like, actually shooting me or just doing anything else. He's just content to, like... He could have an entire pit of spikes right here. But instead, he's just got the two. And he's like, uh, maybe I'll crush him, maybe I won't. Wily, I, I feel like you're not giving me your A-game right now. In your little, in your little Jetsons ship. Even, even the circumstances, uh with which I watched Battlefield Earth originally um, is kind of hilarious. So I kind of I kind of had a bad movie club back home in Chicago when I uh, moved home after college. And um, our source of pride was that we sat through all five Twilight films in the theater. We were completely insane. But like after you go through su sitting through all five Twilight films in the theater, like you fear no film after that, right? And so uh, my 25th birthday came up. And so we're like, you know what we should do? We should watch, like, the worst movies we can possibly think of. And so, top of the list was Battlefield Earth and Mariah Carey's Glitter. Those were the two worst films we could think of at the time. And, um... And by the way, side note, talking about bad movies, like, Glitter is just... Eh. Like, if, if it hadn't had all the production problems, and if it hadn't come out the same week as 9-11, I think it would have just been forgettable. But um, we really, we really enjoyed Battlefield Earth. We thought that film was a blast. Uh, we were just laughing the entire time. And then we get to Glitter, and believe it or not, Glitter was more painful to sit through. It's not even an hour and a half, and that was actually harder to sit through than Battlefield Earth, because Glitter starts off hilariously bad. Make no mistake. But then it kind of get reaches this point where it becomes like achingly sincere, and you just feel sorry for Mariah Carey. Oh, I do have to give props to this final boss. So, I really like the music, and I really like the challenge of this boss fight. Uh, if you're doing a Buster-only run, this actually does require a lot of a lot of finesse and a lot of patience. You really kind of have to stay on your toes because you have no idea where Dr. Wily is going to appear. And if you do manage to collect all of the beat pieces, um, and you do manage to activate beat, uh, he will just hover directly to Dr. Wily, even when he's disappeared and even when he's off screen. And he will just track him down that way. So there is some incentive to collecting the bead pieces just to make this tricky boss fight a little bit easier. Now that being said, there's also a really simple way you can do this. You can just stay in the corner for three seconds. Every time Dr. Wily disappears, and he will generally hover over where you are. And that will give you a free shot. And even if he doesn't, he will normally hover... ...somewhere high up where you have enough room where he won't hit you. So one, two, three. See? And I'm just gonna stand in this corner, wait for those things to go. One, two, three. See what I mean? One, two, three. Up, ah, yep, he's up there, so I don't have to worry about him. One, two, three. This this boss depends on you moving around a lot, so if you don't, that's actually a little bit better. One, two, three. Ah, see, he's onto me. Like, uh, he knows I'm onto his game. One, two, three. 
No, Wiley, I'm not I'm not going anywhere. I'm waiting for you to come to me. One, two, three. There we go. Ah, I didn't get the second shot. One, two, three. Aha! You didn't count on my on my plan of staying perfectly still. And see, even the even the scheme for this, that he's kidnapped Dr. Light, it's like, dude, you could have done that in any one of the other games. I do like this part, though. Mega Man, strong enough to hold up an entire fucking building. That, that has to go a long way. Thank you, Protoman. And yay, Proto Man helped us, so he's a good guide, I think, or, you know, just, what did, what did all of this amount to? We'll never find out, the game is over. Um, so, yeah. Um, uh, this, this one was kind of a tricky one for me, because... I, I hope you guys enjoyed it, but, like, the, you know... This one is definitely probably the the weakest of the original six for me. Um, I'm actually looking forward to Mega Man 6, because I actually have a lot of stuff to talk about there. So I hope you'll forgive me for being very tangential and kind of going off on a bunch of different topics. Um, and uh, this is still a good game, but like there are better Mega Man games, and there's more challenging ones, and there's more rewarding ones. And even... The ones that had some stuff that's rough around the edges, like Mega Man 3 or even Mega Man... Even the first Mega Man game, like... Those rough bits, like, actually added to some of the charm and even added some more challenge and variety in certain areas. This one... This one was so streamlined that... I don't know, they just kind of went... They 180'd around and kind of just made something that was just kind of average. And, uh, I would say, if you have an opportunity, you know, still pick up Mega Man 5, but, uh, in between episodes, I was looking up prices for original cartridges, and Mega Man 5 easily goes for the highest amongst the original games. Like, it averages about, like, 50 to to $100 just for the cartridge, never mind if it comes with the box. Actually, wait a minute. Don't I have, don't I have my cartridge in storage? Uh, like, comment, and subscribe. I think I need to get to eBay.